Good morning, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. We'll give it a second here for everybody to catch up. See people starting to log in. Good morning, everybody. Decided to change the scenery a little bit from last week of just kind of the the bare beige wall. Looks like we still have some people logging in. We'll get started here in a little bit. Good morning, Susie. Good morning, Amy. Hope everybody's having fun in their quarantine. Either having fun or looking, maybe getting ready to lose their mind. It depends on what you're doing. But uh, I know we're having a good time here. Apollo made the comment yesterday that she went to call me when I went out to get some some things and my number was way down the list. It's because I'm home all the time, so she doesn't have to call me. She can just throw something at me from across the room. So I'm, I am enjoying working from home greatly. Good morning, Nan. Before we get started too, I just had another quick announcement from Matt. Uh, Matt's light post, he's going to be doing it actually online. And he still is asking for submissions, for God sightings, things like that. If there's anything that you need to include, you can either message him on Facebook or you can send any, I guess we, we, you can go to our website, it's kwachurch.org backslash newsletter and get Matt any information or anything that he might need or if anything that you feel is relevant. So, you know, don't forget about the light post and how it's going to be electronic going forward. All right, looks like we've we're a few minutes past the hour here. We better go ahead and get started. So I'm going to go ahead and open us up with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much, Lord, for everything that you do, and we're just grateful for um, what's going on in spite of the everything out here. Lord, just break through all this and. Show yourself to people that didn't know you previously, Lord, and just help people to get to know you through this in spite of the mess um, that's going on right now, Lord. We know you can work things out for good, and you promise that you will work things out for good according to your will. And Lord, just help us to stay in that spot and right where we're at with you, Lord, and help us to even get closer because as we draw close to you, you draw closer to us, and that's the relationship that you want. So help us to even deepen our relationship with you through this this crisis right now. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, a current event to talk about, obviously there are many, many, many things that we could be talking about. And I'm tired of hearing about the virus, but it's it's literally what keeps us in the house right now. It keeps us from getting together as as brothers and sisters in a in an in-person setting. And what's really cool though is with technology that we have nowadays, we're virtually together right now. And I know, you know, where there's two or more together, you know, you've got church going on. So just grateful that everybody that is able to log in is able to log in so we can have some semblance of community at this time with everything going on right now. In case, and if, some, if you're feeling isolated, reach out to somebody. And uh, if, if you are someone who's not isolated but feels they can help, then you know, reach out to somebody else that you know is alone, and it's it's really weird not being able just to hop in the car and you know go to a restaurant or go visit people. So let's try to help each other out and stay connected um, as brothers and sisters. But one current event that is happening right now that some people maybe don't know about or don't care. I fell into the latter camp of not caring until I was getting ready for this message. One of them is how. One of the princes of the the royal family of England is not going to be an official royal anymore. He's going to be connected to the family, but he doesn't want to be in Buckingham Palace and be a part of all the mess. Uh, he married an American girl named Meghan, and she and he just did not get along with the rest of the royals and how everything goes. But 
I've heard, and I, I, of course, you know, everything on the internet's true. So I went on the internet and I researched this, that she always kind of had a goal of being a princess. Well, you know, a lot of girls do. You know, if you watch any Disney movies or, you know, look at what costumes girls wear for Halloween, a lot of little girls, not all of them, but a lot of them would love to be a princess. Right, honey? Yeah. Yeah, Gwen, Gwen agrees. She would like to be a princess. That's kind of the ultimate. And she saw a chance to, you know, get to a castle, and she probably saw it as a good thing. And I'm not saying she doesn't love her husband, but, you know, you would think that that would be a nice bonus to marrying somebody if they were literally a prince of a country. You know, you'd get the castle life, you would get all the free stuff, you would, you know, anything that goes along with being a prince, king, queen, princess, you could take advantage of. And it seems like it would be a great thing. Well, what they found right away is that she felt that she didn't get along. She felt that people didn't like her. And she was under an incredible amount of stress. Because you can't be a public figure and not have an incredible amount of stress. I mean, obviously, look at how well-adjusted everybody in Hollywood is. You know, they're, they're so well-adjusted and happy and peaceful that they never get addicted to substances or, you know, go crazy or lose, you know, their sanity through all of it and have to leave. And we know that they actually do. And there's a reason for that, that sometimes a lot of the things the world has to offer you think would be great, they're really not. Um, she said that crushing scrutiny and negativity towards her was the reason for Princess Meghan for wanting to leave and just get out of the royal family and get away from it as much as possible. And now I guess they moved to Canada, but now they're back down to L.A. where she's from. And moral of the story is you know, she thought that the grass was greener on the other side of the castle wall, literally, and found out that it wasn't. And she wanted to go back home, basically. And so the grass is not always greener. And we may think that we're missing out on something. We may think that, you know, this virus is keeping us from doing important things. We may think that, just even take this out of the equation, that the things that we strive for throughout our lives are so important. But what we're finding out in times like this, especially, is that they're really not. Uh, what really matters is what's under your roof and most importantly your relationship with the Lord. So if you have your Bibles there turn to Ecclesiastes and we're going to start in chapter 1 and we're going to read verses 1 through 11. So Ecclesiastes 1 1 through 11 and <laughs> I'm in stereo Paula had uh, she pulled Facebook up on her phone and I heard myself like five seconds ago what I was saying so that was pretty <laughs> that's pretty neat. So <laughs> How's the lighting look, honey? It looks good. Okay, the lighting looks good. And my dog wants to make a cameo again, but he, he changed his mind. So, so Ecclesiastes 1, 1 through 11. I suppose I should turn there myself, huh? I remember in Sunday school one time, April Hill uh, said that Ecclesiastes was written by Ecclesi. And I, that just stuck with me. I thought that was pretty funny, so... Thanks, April. <laughs> you got that stuck in my head now. So Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Now this is going to be kind of like a lament or something where the writer of Ecclesiastes, which we believe to be Solomon, was, uh, you know, lamenting about what's going on in life. Oh, hey, Eric. Uh, we have a distinguished Taiwanese person on, on the line right now, Eric Francisco. Good to see you, buddy. No, don't worry about being late. I'll, it's, it's like 11 o'clock p.m. your time. So hang in there. But thanks for joining. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, 1 through 11. Now, the, the heading on my Bible says everything is meaningless. Now, this isn't going to be a complete downer of a message, so stick with me here. But it says, The word of the teacher, son of David, king of Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What does a man gain from all of his labor, at which he toils under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it goes. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place where the streams come from, there they return again. I remember sometimes wondering, you know, like where, 
when I was a little kid, like, where do the rivers go to? Where do they wind up? Well, you know, from Finding Nemo, we know all drains lead to the ocean, right? So that, there's actually a lot of truth to that. Not all drains. I mean, you could have a cesspool in your backyard. But ultimately, the, the rivers are always flowing. They're flowing into the ocean. And then there's evaporation. There's rain. And we start this cycle all over again. See, God made an incredibly balanced world. And there's nothing wasted. So it seems like the streams will always flow. It seems like the oceans will never be full enough. And, you know, Solomon's making a parallel to just chasing things in life that, you know, we can keep running after things and chasing after things, and there's just never enough. There's never enough in life. Verse 8 says, All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. So maybe you do, but do you ever have, like, one song that you like, and then, like, that's all you listen to 24-7? Now, maybe some people. But uh, at the end of the day, <laughs> we, we like a little variety. You know, a little, you know, variety is the spice of life. So we weren't made to just listen to one song over and over and over and over again, unless it's like that ground. It feels like Groundhog Day, that old movie where the same song woke him up every day. You know, we like a little bit of a variety in things. He says, verse 9, what has been will be again. And what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. This is something I tell myself sometimes. Whenever, you know, things are happening where you're like, oh no, is this the big one? It's not. Uh, Spoiler alert, this thing that we're going through right now, it's going to pass. And then within a probably a year or so, we'll be back to worrying about the things we were worrying about before this crisis hit. And our hope is that we can actually learn from this and, you know, do the right things going forward to minimize when something like this happens again. Um, I tell people all the time at work that there will be another crisis. There'll be another drop in the market. Bad things are going to keep happening because there's nothing new under the sun. And that is totally true. So, you know, there's going to be something else like this in our lifetimes more than likely. So nothing's new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, there is something new. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. There's no remembrance of men of old, and even those who are yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow. So that's kind of a harsh lesson. You know, sometimes we feel, you know, if I left my job, the the walls would burn down and that the company couldn't function without me. Uh, Well, that's not entirely true. And now you may have started the company, it might be in your name, but just kind of putting it in context, what you do will be done by somebody else at some point. And what you are doing now was done by somebody else before you, and And I'm not trying to be, again, Debbie Downer or anything like that, but I'm trying to put some context into general life. The things that we go after, the things that we chase, the things that consume our thoughts and our worries, what's the point, ultimately? And now Solomon, we're going to get even more into, you know, if you don't know Solomon, he has a lot of cred, you know, he has a lot of ability to say these things. And it's not like just somebody who's, you know, poor, a poor person who is woe as me or has never experienced anything. You know, you might say, well, John, well, maybe, you know, he's all upset because he hasn't achieved anything. Well, let's, let's kind of go down Solomon's list of achievements here. So stay in Ecclesiastes, but flip over to chapter 2, and we're going to do 1 through 9. So Ecclesiastes 2, 1 through 9. See, I can't call on anybody to read because I'm the only one with a microphone. So Ecclesiastes 2, 1 through 9. I thought in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is foolish. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly. My mind still guided me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was worthwhile for men to do under heaven during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasures of kings and provinces. I acquired men and women singers and a harem as well, the delights of the heart of man. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I'm getting worn out just reading this. So basically, he started out with like a perpetual spring break. And then that turned into, I'm accumulating things. 
and then that turned into I'm growing my family and then that turned into I'm making gardens and I'm doing all these things that are supposed to bring people happiness which is what we strive for and if you read you know secular books on success it's all about accumulation of stuff and accumulation of friends family and things like that now we all know that friends and family are much more important than accumulating stuff we know that but Solomon is basically saying that he he got all of this he got all the stuff he had all the the spring break, break mentality he had you know a huge family he had you know friends in his house that were born in his house he had all kind of things that people chase after and let's keep reading down in verse 10 and 11 he says I denied myself nothing my eyes desired I refused my heart no pleasure my heart took delight in all my work and this was the reward for all my labor yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve everything was meaningless a chasing after the wind and nothing was gained under the sun so some of you may feel like you're chasing everything in the wind right now at this point with what's going on with maybe you're, you're laid off or you've lost your job or you can't see the people that you love you can't do the things that you love you know you can't go to water parks or anything like that you know everything's quarantined you can't go bowling you can't you know go watch a basketball game everything's done so it's it's basically to the point where this virus whether it's you know intended or not you know because God works through everything now he doesn't cause all the bad but he allows it to happen and he's working in it he's still working right now this could be a time of healing for us to where we could get together and zero back in onto what's really important take a step back from work maybe you're proud of your accomplishments in something maybe you've achieved some new level on, a, on your favorite video game that you're all proud about or maybe you've you know gotten a promotion at work you've cracked the code of feeding food your kids food that they like to eat you could be getting into something that that actually you know you start to feel proud about but what we realize is that number one that can all be taken away and number two if it is taken away what else do you have left and I don't know if you've ever thought about that and sometimes I've said that from the pulpit that it is is Jesus alone enough is he enough to make you happy and to have peace and to be satisfied with what you're doing and ultimately we know that this world is temporary and that we have a better place to go to but while we're here is your relationship with Christ enough to get you through a time like this so it's it's gut check time is, is what we like to say sometimes so now we're gonna flip to the New Testament and we're gonna see what Jesus himself has to say about these things so we're gonna go to Luke chapter 12 so again I got I can cheat I've got little tabbies in my Bible but I'll give you guys a minute to get there it's Luke chapter 12 and we're gonna start at verse 16 so Luke 12 16 and he told them this parable the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop he thought to himself what shall I do I have no place to store my crops anybody ever ever have that problem except usually it's not crops it's stuffed animals or uh, toys or old electronics or it's you know anything like that you know we've been doing a lot of cleaning Paula spent about two weeks on Gwen's room and now it looks awesome but let's see how long we can keep it that way honey how about that I'm gonna keep it clean yeah yeah she's kind of embarrassed right now so <laughs> so we have a kind of a mass uh, pile of animals up there so he had no place to store his stuff he made so much and did so well and then he said this is what I'll do I will tear down my barns and build bigger barn barns and there I will store all my grain and my goods and I'll say to myself you have plenty of good things laid up for many years take life easy eat drink and be merry well that sounds like a sound financial decision doesn't it that you know if you have a bumper crop if you're a farmer um, if you're in the stock market and you've tripled your money in 10 years you know just build bigger stuff right to hold your things you know have a, a, open another bank account to store all of your extra earnings you know literally build an extra shed in your backyard to store all your stuff that you've accumulated and just keep going right because that you know why wouldn't you do that if that's the whole of your existence so keep building more stuff verse 20 said but God said to him you fool 
Now, if God starts a sentence off with "you fool," you know that's probably not pretty good, and that's something that is going to maybe you should kind of pay attention to what he's about to say next. We'll put it that way. So, if God ever smacks you in the head and says "you fool," you know here it comes. He said, "This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself?" This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. And I see this all the time at work, that people save and do without and never give a penny to anybody. I, I had a, knew a guy that would go get free meals from the local church, and he was a millionaire. The point is, is that people spend their whole life accumulating literally paper, which is debt, in the form of money. Or they, they accumulate things that can rust or burn down or be stolen. And then when they pass away, who gets it? You know, like they say, the money go, all goes back in the Monopoly box when the game's over. So this is all just a temporary thing that we are stewards here with. So if you're chasing how many Facebook friends you can have, if you're chasing how many followers on Instagram you can get, if you're chasing having the biggest brokerage account or the biggest house, when your life is required of you, when you're done... So what? You know, Solomon even said, while you're alive, so what? How many really, really, really happy people do you know that aren't a part or connected with the Lord or doing the Lord's will? I mean, very, very few. Because there's always something else that we're chasing after. And there's something else that we feel that we're missing out on. It's that FOMO thing, fear of missing out. Anybody have FOMO? Anybody? Sometimes, yeah. There's a few hands raising in here. Uh, the dog is one of them too. He's he's always miss, afraid of missing out on treats and getting pet. But at the end of the day, the things that we're afraid of missing out on don't matter. I hope you have FOMO or fear of missing out about not being a part of the ministry for the kingdom. That's what we should really be striving for. So we need to be willing to care about the things that God ultimately cares about. Now, we're going to stay in Luke chapter 12, and we're just going to bump down a little bit down the discourse of Jesus here, and we're going to go to verse 32. He says, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Well, that's encouraging, isn't it? You know, after everything going on and, and reading what Solomon has to say, because we still like to, we, we put all of our thoughts in this little box of what's here and now, but Jesus says the father is excited to give you the kingdom. He wants to do that. He, he's literally building a place for you. Let's keep reading. He says, Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. Um, anybody ever have a purse that doesn't wear out? Or if you're a guy, a messenger bag, if, it's, you know, if it might be European or something like that? Things wear out. Now, sometimes you can buy better quality and it lasts a little bit longer. But at the end of the day, everything's going to rust. Everything's going to deteriorate. We can't escape the laws of thermodynamics unless God miraculously intervenes like he did for the children of Israel multiple times. But the point is, is that everything wears out and winds down. And that's the way God created the universe, which is more of a testimony to him and his creative ability because nothing can, can't, you can't have nothing explode and make everything. We have to start with an initial all-powerful first cause, which is God. There, there's no way around it. So God created everything, spun it up, and it's winding down. So these things that we're trying to accumulate, they are going to rust, tarnish, deteriorate, or ultimately burn at some point. So the things that we strive for, we, we have to say, okay, is this really what we should be going after? Should we be worried about what's going on around us, or should we worry about what God worries about? Well, spoiler alert, we need to worry about what God is worrying about. So he says, provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So Solomon put himself to the test and said, hey, I'm going to test and see if getting stuff is going to make you happy. And his conclusion, the guy who had more stuff than anybody ever will, was absolutely not. Now, God is promising peace, happiness, and contentment when you're in his will. At the end of the day, that's the important thing, is that if you're in the will of God, no matter what circumstance that you're in, you will have the peace that you're searching for. You'll have the contentment that you're searching for. And if God does give you some measure of wealth, because really anybody in this country 
typically is is wealthy when you look at the rest of the world standards i was listening to um, an interview for a little bit of a doctor that was spending time in fiji and it's a problem what we have here with this coronavirus with you know supplies for medical needs they call it ppe equipment personal protection equipment we are wringing our hands and rightfully so about having equipment to protect the healthcare workers but in other countries out there that's just everyday life that okay we don't have anything so what are we going to do and I'm not saying that we're better than them or they're better than us, but what I am saying is that if we put things in the proper context, it's not wrong to be concerned about taking care of your family and to be providing, but you've got to be willing to take everything that you do have and give it back to God. If you can't give it back to God, it's become an idol to you, and it needs to be eradicated. So, you know, no thief can just steal, you know, your relationship with the Lord. No moth can come in and eat away your ticket to heaven. And where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So if your treasure is the kingdom of God, you'll find yourself finding ways in a time like this during a coronavirus out, global pandemic to spread the gospel. And it's not going to be easy because, again, we are all mostly isolated from ourselves. But it, this could also be a time of self-reflection and prayer and getting closer to God and asking, okay, when we're allowed out of the house again, what am I supposed to be doing? Or while we're stuck here, is there something I should be donating or giving or calling people or writing letters or doing something? You know, is, is there an opportunity in this somewhere to be the light of the world that Jesus wants us to be? Okay, so God cares about everyone. He cares about us going through this. So, there are many, many passages, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to go much longer here, but there are many, many passages talking about, you know, how much Jesus loves us, what we're supposed to be doing, how we're supposed to take care of the sick, the poor, the widows, the orphans. Um, you know, Jesus says that I'm standing at the door of your heart and knocking, asking for a relationship with you. And also, when Judgment Day happens, when because it, it will, we serve a God of, who is just and who will call us into account someday, he's going to ask, you know, what did you do for the, the least of my people? Did you clothe them? Did you feed them? Did you visit them when they were sick? Did you visit them in prison? So there's a couple of things we can do. We can send clothes. We can send food to food banks. We can call people that are sick and visit with them over the phone or write them a letter. So we can be the light of the world that people want because at the end of the day, nobody cares if you have a pile of stuff. In fact, it, it brings a lot of negative attention towards you as well. But what they do care about is how much you care about them. And it's, it's the old adage in sales when I had you know, some sales jobs that no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. So if you don't have someone else's best interest in mind, they're not going to care what advice you have for them because it's not valid. Uh, let's go to Matthew 22 real quick. And then we'll, uh, we'll say a prayer and we'll, we'll wrap things up here. But Matthew 22... So Matthew 22, and we're going to start at verse 34. He says, Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like this, Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So in a time like this where we're isolated, where there's things going on, where there's a lot of panic, if we focus on loving the Lord and then loving others as much as ourselves, it's going to help us get through a time like this. And I'm even seeing it on you know, daytime news that the way to get over anxiety, depression, and, and lack of peace is to care about other people. Well, we have the ultimate charge from God himself to care about other people. Number one, we have to love the Lord our God first with everything and focus on him. And then we need to worry about everybody else around us as much as we do ourselves. So again, my prayer is that as a church, as a group of people, we can find a way to bless other people through this time. And you know, this, the sermon topic was really kind of, kind of what's the point of all of this? What's the point of life? 
The point of life is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love other people as much as you love yourself. If you take care of those two things, you've got the purpose of life. And if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, Jesus tells us, if you love me, you're going to obey me, and you're going to keep my commandments. And I've used the marriage analogy from the pulpit a few times that, you know, if you love your spouse but don't pay any attention to them or don't do anything that they want, do you really love them or or do they even feel loved by you? Even more so, if we say that we love the Lord and we love Jesus, do what he says. And we don't have a works-based salvation. The salvation is given to us free on the cross. It was paid for. But do we really love him? And if we do really love him, it should show in how we live our lives and the things that we care about. So just a little, when you have time alone in prayer, reading your Bible, meditating, you know, ask the Lord, Lord, do I love you with all my heart, soul, mind, strength? If not, help me. Because he will. He's faithful. He's better than us. He, he's not going to leave you. He's not going to leave you high and dry. He loves you and he died for you. And if you don't have a relationship with the Lord, you know, in Romans chapter 10, it says, if you believe with in the Lord with your heart and confess with your tongue that he's the Son of God, you'll be saved. You know, we're told many times, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Once you're saved, it's, you know, you, you can develop that closer and more loving relationship with him. And going forward, we can be the salt and the light of the world. And, you know, what's the purpose of everything? The purpose of everything is to love the Lord, to love other people. And if you're still on this planet, you still have a job to do. And even though we're stuck in the house or we're stuck isolated from each other, we can still love Kenmore. We can still love Akron. We can still love the world you know, for the cause of Christ. So let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we know that you're in control through all this. And we may feel like everything we work so hard for is being taken from us, whether it's a job loss, whether it's isolation from friends and family, whether it's starting a business or whatever it is, Lord, whether it's our own health. But we know that ultimately the stuff that we chase after on this in this life at the end of the day is, has nothing to do with you what's, what you want for us for eternity because you've already made and are making a better place than this for us to spend eternity with in with you. And Lord, if we have our priorities mixed up, if we're not caring about the sick, if we're not caring about the widows and the orphans and the poor and the people in prison, maybe use this time, Lord, to refocus our lives and our hearts onto what really matters for you. And Lord, if there's somebody out here that is not saved, please keep knocking on the door of their heart and please help them to accept you as Lord and Savior today. If there is someone who's saved that's neglected you, that's allowed the cares of the world to get in between them, like the parable of the sower, and to choke out their relationship with you, Lord, maybe this is a time where those things have been taken away and those idols have been torn down. And just um, get closer to them and, and run to them like we know that you will. And help them open the door of their hearts to you and love you deeper. And Lord, it's in your name we pray. Amen. So we're going to continue doing some things like this throughout this time. Now the format may change a little. Uh, Matt and I were talking about possibly, you know, doing some sort of, you know, pre-recorded message and using YouTube as well as other multiple platforms because we know not everybody has a Facebook account and possibly we could do, you know, multiple things and wrap them into one package to where we can simulcast or simulblast, whatever you want to say, messages. And Matt even had a few ideas. This is Matt Branham, if you don't know who I'm talking about. Because we are alone, maybe setting up like virtual um, card games or anything like that, playing Scrabble or something as a group, as a church group. If people are shut in but still want to interact, we can do those things with the technology that we have today. So if any, again, if anybody has any suggestions, you can message me. Uh, you can go on our church's Facebook page, message Matt, of course, but we got to find a way to stay connected with each other throughout this time because, you know, we are a body and, you know, the vine is, is Christ. Everything needs to be grounded in Christ and, and, and what he wants, but we are all branches and we have things that we can be doing. So um, thank you so much for everybody that, that I guess virtually stopped in here to our living room and um, just we, we all we all love each other as a church and we continue to do that through these times of looking for a new pastor and now being isolated from each other uh, God still has a, a really big plan for us and I'm excited to see what he does so if anybody ever wants to talk chat email Facebook message whatever you know we're open and uh, 
please reach out to each other. But uh, with that, I'll go ahead and sign off.